So uh, our next speaker is Gonzalo Otazo. Um, he's an assistant professor at New York Institute of Technology uh, at the College of Osteopathic Medicine. And his talk is titled, Odor Identification in Novel Olfactory Environments is Selectively Impaired in a Mouse Model of Autism. Uh, we will also post his um, Twitter handle and also link to the uh, recent uh, preprint. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. So uh, autism uh, presents with problems of generalization to novel stimuli. Uh, for example, a, a person with autism uh, can uh, recognize dogs, but then once, and but if you're presenting him with a dog hand, then he would think that that dog is a cat. That is kind of a temple grand, the, the, the autism uh, uh, advocate. So our hypothesis is that there is a fundamental computation that is uh, affected in autism, and we want to use uh, to, to determine if this computation uh, is also affected in mouse models of autism uh, using olfaction. So our hypothesis is that the wild-type mice, neurotypical mice, rely on a robust algorithm to identify the target odors in novel olfactory environments, and that this computation is affected in the mouse model of autism and should not be able to identify targets in novel environments. So in order to approach this, we use a, a commonly known task called the, the CAPTCHA. So you know CAPTCHA is uh, in the internet, the visual CAPTCHA, where you have a known target, usually some letters, and then you put some novel backgrounds and, and on top of it, and then you have to read the letters. And this task actually is computationally very hard as well because we don't know how to solve this as efficiently as the brain does. So we want to translate this into olfaction. So we're using head fixed mice that are water deprived. And then very quickly, we can train these mice to lick if there is one, uh, to one of the two target odors and to refrain from licking uh, if there is the novel odors. And our task is a little bit more complicated than that. There is a training set where there is a contextual background then there's limonene, and then the target appears, and based on the target, the mouse decides to lick or not. And then we can train animals to do these tasks, and over nine days, they are doing it uh, very well. And then one day, we are going to replace this limonene by a novel background odor, and that is our refractory capture. So uh, in order to uh, quantify how hard this task is, which is one of the problems of working with olfaction, we use uh, intrinsic optical imaging, to observe the glomeruli activation produced by the others. So uh, the backgrounds uh, that we use with the contextual background, these four contextual backgrounds are actually activate, are strongly activated glomeruli, much strongly than the targets. The limonene is like, it's a weak, it's sort of weak, and the novel backgrounds are intermediate between the targets and the contextual background. So, to give you an idea how hard this is, these are imaging of the mixture that the mice need to uh, classify. These are the known go mixtures. So here, the, in, in this order includes the, these mixtures include the uh, go target, and this one includes a no go target. And they have, because the backgrounds are so strong, at the end, the mixtures, the known mixtures are very similar to the no go mixtures. So, by itself, even if you know the others, this task is hard, but then we make it even harder to make it into a captcha by replacing uh, the limonene by this novel odor acetal. And then now it becomes much harder. You have to, this uh, example, for example, should classify is to the gold mixtures and not to the gold. So it's actually a hard task. And uh, mice, the, the olfactory experts that they are, they solve this task at 77%. Not as well as the known backgrounds. I mean, this no, with the known background, the animal practiced this over thousands of trials. They don't do as well, but still is uh, pretty significant with 50% being chance. So, uh, so we're very uh, happy that wild-type mice can solve this task. But as it turns out, a very simple algorithm called the nearest neighbor using the glomeruli data from our imaging can actually match very well the performance of the animal. So here, each dot corresponds to the performance on a novel background order, and this uh, nearest neighbor uh, can be implemented using the, the, sorry, the circuitry in the olfactory system. 
And it's just that's the simplest thing that you can imagine. So you get a novel mixture that includes a novel odor and then find the best match and the best match is a go, then you should, this should probably go at the novel mixture. And that very simple algorithm predicts the animal behavior. Are the animals doing this very simple algorithm? We don't think so because uh, there are four contextual background odors, four two go odors, two no go odors. So there's a total of 16 mixtures on the training set that we use for the imaging and for the behavior. And then we reduce that by half. So the animal is going to get half of the training data. And when we do that, these algorithms, the nearest neighbor and also the linear classifier performance drop. And a group of three new animals that uh, were trained with this reduced set, their performance was unaffected compared to animals. So, so the animals are doing some a very sophisticated algorithm that can actually, uh, with very few training data, can perform very well. So they are very good at generalizing, better than these uh, simple algorithms. We try. Is this computation affected in the mouse model of autism? So uh, we, we use the CADNAP2 mouse model of autism, which uh, uh, produces seizures and autism in humans and hyperactivity. And people have looked at these mice and they do have a phenotype where they show reduced interest in social orders. However, these CADNAP2 uh, knockout mice are not anosmic. In fact, they are twice as fast as wild type mice in finding food buried in, in, in bedding. So uh, we look at the uh, glomeruli uh, responses uh, using our intrinsic median, and they were almost identical to the wild type mice. We look at, at try to use some classifier, and performance was almost identical. So, in fact, there's no difference on the performance of these animals when they train. They train as equal, as fast and, and equally well as the wild type mice, and they do very well on the uh, on the non background. Order. Remember, this is very uh, difficult, very subtle differences, but this wild, this cat, cat, two knockout mice have no problem on that. However, when we change to novel background odors, the performance drops significantly. So the, these mice are not able to solve this task with novel backgrounds as well as the wild type mice. So what are the possible uh, confounders not related to the olfactory processing? Uh, one is that these cat, cat, two mice have uh, are hyperactive. They recur. They cover twice the distance than wild type mice. So maybe they have problems with holding leaking when you are presented with a novel background odor, and they will leak wildly. But that's not what happened. In fact, the opposite. The catnap two mice. The type of mistake that they do is they fail to leak when there is a go odor in the presence of a novel background odor. So that's what they do. So it's not that they are over hyperactive or that hyperactivity is not affecting this behavior. Another possibility is they have reduced interest in the others, uh, so they have less time to explore. However, they have the similar phenotype. This is a head fixed behavior. When you present a novel odor in the wild type, uh, the mice increase the sniff rate, and the catnap to do something similar. When they present it with a novel odor, they explore it. So the exploration seems not to be affected. Uh, what seems to be affected, we found it very interesting, is the reaction that wild type mice they slow down when they're uh, challenged with a novel background order. And the catnap two don't do that. So we believe that this computation takes time and the mice are actually, uh, this computation requires time and the catnap two cannot engage in this computation. So I'll show you that wild type mice can solve these olfactory captures and the uh, catnap two mice cannot solve this task. And I would like to thank you for your attention. This is the students that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Gonzalo, for the very nice talk. Um, thanks a lot. Um, so uh, let's check if we have any questions. Uh, for now, I don't see any questions, uh, but I have a question. Um, so you say that the catnap mice were twice as fast as finding food than wild, wild type mice, correct? Yes, yes. Um, why do you think that might be the case? Just because so, of their hyperactivity or? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. We don't know why. Uh, one possibility is that they detect the odor, but then they move much faster and dig the, the food uh, uh, faster. 
But uh, that's just to illustrate that these mice uh, are not anosmic. That, and in fact, if you look at the periphery, their olfactory processing seems to be unaffected. So you don't think that um, that might be the case? Yeah, uh, that. Yeah, I mean, there. Uh, I mean, there's all these. Uh, so uh, people with autism sometimes they have like abilities that are exceed uh, the neurotypical uh, mm -hmm. uh, people. For example, they, they are very good at, at finding uh, small details. But and I think that. Uh, uh, this mouse model of autism might have that ability to, to do like this very fine uh, discrimination as long as it corresponds to a stimulus that they know pretty well. So the bedding, they know pretty well, the food, they know pretty well, so that they are pretty good at finding and might be even better. We have not tested that, but this is just to illustrate that they are not actually anosmic. That there, there, there might be other mouse models of autism that have anosmia or hyposmia, and then they should not be able to do stats as well. That's why we actually choose this one because we knew that they were pretty good at doing olfactory behaviors. I see. Um, so is it uh, because um, that drew my attention? But maybe I mean I'm not that familiar with the topic. So uh, the number of mice that uh, were included in each condition were like three, four, uh, number of trials were high, I guess relatively high, but would that be the case or it's like just a preliminary? Uh, so we, I mean, this is for, for the poster, uh, we have tested, I'm showing only like three uh, of the wild type, we test only three mice on this task, but we tested different variation of this type. In total, we have tested over 17 mice or almost almost 20 mice. And the performance is always 77, 76, doesn't change much. So it was really, uh, respect to that distribution, these four mice stand out that, that they dropped. And we have the control task that they are actually engaged and behavior is fine. But of course, we would like to increase our number. We also are interested not only of focusing on the CAPNA2 mice, you know, autism, each mutation in autism corresponds to very few cases. So we actually are interested on testing other models of autism. And we're also interested on all, these are genetic models. There are also some environmental models like the Malproic acid, and we're also interested in testing if they would also show this uh, phenotype. Yeah, this is step one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we have one, um, actually, no, two, no, just one question, right? So shall I just read the letter? Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, please. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, it's from uh, Hector Baez. Does increased false rejection occur primarily because uh, mice take much less time in decision making compared to the wild type? So that, yeah. False, false rejection. Uh, so, I mean, the, the mice take the, the cat, the cat up to knockout mice, when they react, they react very fast, faster than the, than the, uh, than the wild type mice and similar speed as when they do the task with the, on the, on the known orders. So you would have expected that because they react so fast, then maybe they should produce actually false positives, but the error that they have is false negative. So the order is there, the, the target is there, but they don't leak. Uh, so we don't know uh, exactly why. One possibility is that the mice don't like drinking water in the presence of this novel odor that they might find aversive, that's a possibility. However, when the mice leak, what, we immediately close the odor so that the water is not going to have that. Uh, we try not to have present the odor with the water at the same time. However, we don't know if, if that will be enough to clear out the uh, odor from the nostril. Uh, it seems that and in, in the, all the behavior that people have tried, for having um, training mice to doing this uh, leaking go no go task, headstick behavior, Mo in most of the cases, the errors that people see are mouse leaking for every other. So it actually was very surprising, not only in this task but in the context of the other tasks that people have tried, that they don't leak, and that that's actually that was, we found that very surprising. So it seems. 
to us that either they are the novel odors are really aversive, although if it's really aversive, the best thing that you can do is lick and then that stops the odor delivery. Or the other possibility is that they actually are able to detect the, the target or the target odor. One speculation that we do is that maybe that's why novel odors are aversive for this uh, mouse model of autism is, is the same way that for the children, human children, going into a dark place is, is uh, distressful because you won't be able to detect what is in there. So if you enter in an environment with a novel odor, maybe these mice know that they are not going to detect if there are predators or anything, and that might find distressful. Well, that's just a, an interpretation. But I, I tell you why, like from a interpret from the point of view of the mind, how he perceived that, uh, we don't know yet. But actually, it's a hard question to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot uh, also for the talk, and um, thanks to the uh, panelists and attendees for the questions. So we can move on. Uh